Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Eric. Uh, this is our first time recording this podcast before noon, and it's also the first time recording this podcast on a weekend, and I greatly appreciate you being here because neither of us really want to do this on the weekend, but you know, having been on the hotline all week, we got a lot of phone calls about this issue today. What's That's- that issue, Joe? Don't worry, Eric. I got I got my coffee. We're good to go. I think this is coffee. You think this is coffee. We so hope gonna, it's coffee. We're going to talk about chloramines. We're going to talk about complex chlorine stuff. Yeah. Combined chlorine. Combined chlorine 101. In this episode, this is the first of, t- of a two-part episode, and it's, uh, it's going to explain what it is. What is combined chlorine? How is it measured? What does it actually mean? And then in the next episode, we're going to dive into how to reduce it, how to get it out of your water. And that's a much more in depth, and I want to make a disclosure before we get going. This is advanced chemistry. It is, uh, it's a very complex thing, and we are really going to have to distill it down. And so, if you are a chemist and you're listening to this, please understand that we're speaking to a broader audience that does not have a chemistry degree, just like me. I don't have a chemistry degree, so I'm trying to simplify this. It's not going to be exactly right to every detail, but it's going to be factual and it's going to be simplified dramatically. Would you agree with that, Joe? I'd agree with that. That's the goal. All right. We're going to attempt to make analogies and they're not going to be great because it's <laughs> not the easiest thing. We were kind of laughing about it because it's kind of hard to make analogies on what this actually is, but we're going to do our best. This is episode 32 of the Rule Your Pool podcast. I'm Eric Knight with Arenda. Joe Sweezy, our VP of sales. He's the one with the chemistry degree. I'm going to lean on him for this. So Joe, let's go. Ready to go. Welcome to Rule Your Pool the podcast by Arenda that explains and simplifies pool chemistry so that anybody, regardless of experience, can understand it. I'm your host, Eric Knight, bringing clarity to these subjects so that you can bring clarity to your water. If you're ready to rule your pool, then let's go. Okay, Joe, I got a lot of calls about combined chlorine. Okay, actually, no, let me rephrase. I got a lot of calls about other problems and then they tell me their chemistry and it comes to find out that they have combined chlorine. And usually it's like, well, what's that? So Joe, what is combined chlorine? Yeah, combined chlorine is basically the form of chlorine that gets used up during the chlorination process. So you've got two different forms of chlorine, your free available chlorine, the good chlorine you want to sanitize, oxidize, disinfect. And then you've got this combined chlorine, the chlorine that's basically been used up. In the swimming pool, it's really almost useless. It has maybe a little bit depending on its compound of sanitizing ability, but mostly useless. So you want to get rid of it. That's the form of chlorine we're talking about today. And it tends to be uh, something that you just would rather avoid altogether. Now, let me, let's narrow even further than that. What does chlorine have to actually combine with? This is a a very leading question, of course. Uh, Why we call it combined chlorine in the first place. What does chlorine have to combine with for it to show up on a total chlorine kit or a total chlorine test? Good question. Yeah, so it combines with nitrogen, right? So it's uh, the nitrogen-containing compounds that are out there. That's what it combines with, and that's when it forms your chloramine compounds. And there's a lot of different ways that it can get Mm -hmm. that nitrogen, but, you know, we see it, uh, you know, that's where the complexity of this comes in. Right. So that's that's the key here. If you take nothing else away from this episode, if you have combined chlorine, there is nitrogen in your water in some form. We talk about nitrogen compounds all the time as one of the big three on the oxidant demand. You know, the, the hegemon of oxidants is going to be non-living organics, you know, the typical bather wastes. But then you have nitrogen compounds, which we're discussing today, and you also have metals. But we're going to dwell on nitrogen compounds because if you don't have nitrogen in your pool, you don't have any combined chlorine. There's nothing for chlorine to combine with. It'll just oxidize and you're never going to read it again. So Joe, when you're measuring total chlorine, what are you actually measuring? So when total chlorine is measuring your free chlorine, that's the good chlorine and your combined chlorine together. So in order to get your combined chlorine reading, you have to know what your free chlorine level is and what your total chlorine level is. And then the difference between the two is your combined chlorine level. If you have no difference, you have no combined chlorine, and that's ideal. Yeah, it's absolutely ideal. In fact, a lot of health departments um, can shut down public pools if they have too much combined chlorine because it's a reflection that you have too much going on and your chlorine is falling behind. Now, where I live, that threshold is 0.2, 0.2 parts per million combined chlorine is as much as they'll tolerate. Some states will be 0.5. 
I actually took a call from Minnesota that's 0.5 for them, uh, which is you know more than double what it is here in North Carolina. But that's not a lot. I mean, Joe, we're talking you know less than you know half or less of one part per million. So there's really very little tolerance for this combined chlorine. Why do you think that is? Well, there's a number of reasons for that, but one is obviously it's a measure of how effective your chlorine is in your swimming pool. And if you have combined chlorine that's forming, it's not being totally effective or you've got something in the pool that's causing it to combine that you've just got a, it's an indicator of a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Also, your combined chlorine tends to be the irritant of the chlorine family. So if you're getting skin irritation, eye irritation, if you smell that chlorine in the swimming pool that smells bad, like dirty socks or the locker room smell, that's combined chlorine that you're smelling. So those are the, the irritants that you don't want to have there. And so you're basically just protecting the swimming pool and the bather from those kinds of things. Now, we in the industry, we, uh, we use the term chloramines very generally. Chloramines describe interchangeably with the word combined chlorine, honestly, but that's not scientifically accurate, is it, Joe? <laughs> it's not exactly scientifically accurate, no. But, but it gets the point across. So chloramines basically represent chlorine byproducts of oxidizing nitrogen compounds in general. But technically, there's three types of chloramines, and they only fall into one category of this conversation. So let's divide this nitrogen compounds into two categories. There's inorganic nitrogen, and there's organic nitrogen. Now the inorganic nitrogen is basically pure ammonia, NH3. That's a nitrogen with three hydrogens on it. That is what might be in your drinking water. If they deliberately put chloramines in your drinking water, what they're actually putting in is pure nitrogen. And then they're chlorinating that water so that the chlorine combines at a, a very exact ratio to create mono or dichloramines in your tap water. The reason for that is there is some disinfection power to monochloramine. And it's a lot slower than free chlorine or hypochlorous acid. I mean, hundreds of times slower. Well, some book, this book here that I have in front of me, of course, I've got my notes. Um, it's 60 to 100 times slower. But dichloramine is, is even slower than that. The point is, if you are chloraminating water, this is especially the case in suburbs and rural areas, not so much inside main cities. Um, the further the water has to travel from the plant, the longer you want to extend that disinfection. That's why they want to slow down chlorine by combining with ammonia. At least that's my understanding of it from what I read. And I read a whole bunch of this stuff before this episode. Now, Joe, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. Is that your understanding too, or am I missing something? No, that's definitely part of it. It's also very stable um, in an enclosed environment like that when it's going through the water system. So, you know, the stability is an important part of that as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like adding phosphates to your drinking water. It's, it's a good thing for your system for the water treatment system. It's not a bad thing for us necessarily. It's a lot softer for us to consume than free chlorine, even though it's in such small amounts. It's just this one case where it's a real pain and that's swimming pools, just like phosphates. You know, phosphates are great for your lawn. They're great for drinking water. They're great for your dog. They're a real pain in a swimming pool. Same thing with combined chlorine. <laughs> you, you know, it's not, it's not a bad thing. It's keeping your water safe. It is, it, it does carry some disinfection, but man, oh man, when you have it in your tap water and it gets into your pool, you're going to struggle with holding chlorine. And the reason for that is there's more to the process. So if you get monochloramine out of your tap, you, you can't just say, okay, you know, it's going to get used up. No, no, no. The only way you get that out of your water is by throwing more chlorine at it to get through this process. And it's a three-stage process. The first thing, remember, we're talking about inorganic here. We, we haven't even gotten to organics yet, Joe. That's, a, that's the bulk of the conversation. I want to knock this easy part out. Pure ammonia, NH3, three hydrogens around one nitrogen. When you throw, it's a five to one molar ratio, okay? Uh, that's a weight ratio in chemistry I've, I've recently learned. A five to one rate, weight ratio of hypochlorous acid, HOCl, the killing form of chlorine. You're going to chlorinate this ammonia. And when you hit that five to one molar ratio, one of those three hydrogens gets replaced with a chloride. Now you have a monochloride chloramine. Now, 
take that monochloramine and throw another five to one molar ratio of more HOCl. And now you have two chlorides because it replaced another hydrogen. Now it's a dichloramine. We've got a great chart. It's a beautiful chart, Joe. I illustrated it myself. <laughs> That's how I know it's beautiful. Uh, but it's in a whole bunch of our articles. And it illustrates that, yes, we're just simply replacing hydrogens. We started with three hydrogens. Now we've only got one left because two of those hydrogens have been replaced with chlorides. Once again, do another five to one molar ratio of hypochlorous acid. It's going to replace that third hydrogen. And now you have a nitrogen with three chlorides called nitrogen trichloride more commonly known as trichloramine. Now, this is the last final phase. You cannot oxidize this thing further. It has to go somewhere. And where does it go? It goes into the air. This is trichloramine. This is the main culprit of the quote-unquote pool smell. So if you smell chlorine when you walk into a building because it has a swimming pool indoors, or the, the smell that irritates your nose, your eyes, I was a competitive swimmer who got really sick from this. Trichloramines is one of the main thing that you're going to be smelling. It has to off gas. It's part of this process. There's no other thing for it to do. The only thing that you could do to stop it, and we're going to go further into prevention and, and reduction in the next episode, would be to destroy it with a secondary system. Like an, an ozone AOP or UV system can destroy these things when they're in the water. But when trichloramines go into the air... Joe, they're an air problem. There's nothing a UV system or anything else can do at that point. It's in the air. Now it's an HVAC question and it's air physics and, and all that stuff. And these things are heavier than oxygen. So they stay in the bottom of the room, right in the breathing zone of people like me having to gasp for, gasp for air during a two hour swim practice. There's long-term exposure issues with this and a whole bunch of other chloroorganic compounds, which we'll discuss in a second. These are the things that people get sick from. And so I want to just take a little bit of a segue here, Joe. When people say, oh, you have to have 7.4 to 7.6 pH. We talked about this in previous episodes. The two main reasons that the textbooks, I have some of them in front of me, why they say you have to maintain that pH. One of them is chlorine strength. If you don't have cyanuric acid in your pool, yes, the lower your pH, the stronger the chlorine. But the other one is bather comfort. This is where I want to bring this topic and relate it to that. I don't buy it, Joe. I, I flat out, I don't buy it. I've got my 10,000 hours in the pool. Um, I have never believed that the pH alone is what's going to drive bather comfort. I, it has always been this. It has always been disinfection byproducts. And that's what irritates our eyes. That's what gives us skin rashes. That's what hurts our lungs. That's what hurts our noses. It's not the pH because I've got tap water that has a pH of 8. I've got a bottled water that I buy at Costco. It has a pH of 9.5. They even out advertise it. It's alkaline, you know. But then I also drink Deer Park water, which has a pH of 5. They don't irritate me, right? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just drinking bottled water. So I'm here to tell you, this is Eric's opinion, um, but <laughs> it's, it's a very... Backed up in experience opinion. It's probably a better way to say that. It's early in the morning, Joe. Let me go. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an informed opinion. It's an educated opinion because I have a lot of experience in these pools themselves. Disinfection byproducts are what cause this pain. It's not the pH of your water. So this bather comfort thing, that's why I really want to talk about this in this episode. Not only because we had phone calls, but it's, it's very personal to me. These byproducts are annoying. So that, Absolutely. that's a, yeah, I just wanted to get that off my chest. I feel a lot better. This is like therapy, Joe. Th well, this let me podcast. throw another log on that. I'll throw another log on that fire. Yeah, too, burn it up, dude. I, I, burn it I, up. I heard a lot of people over the course of my time, especially in hot tubs, say, oh, I'm, I'm allergic to chlorine. I can't use chlorine because I'm allergic yeah. to chlorine. And most of the time, they're not allergic to chlorine. They're irritated by the chloramines because they haven't maintained their water chemistry well enough to avoid having them in the water. So usually those people who, and I'm not going to say that there's nobody that's allergic to chlorine. There's plenty, I'm sure of that. Um, and, but if you really maintain your water well, and you're not getting these chloramines constantly in the, in the water, and especially in a spa where it's a, a smaller environment and, um, you know, a, a lot 
closer with the evaporation and things that are going on right at the surface, those can be very irritating there in that small setting. So it is very possible that your irritation is coming from the chloramines and not the chlorine itself, not the free available. I'm glad you brought that up because now you're giving me some PTSD because, well, you're not giving it to me. It's, it's bringing it back up because I, I went to the hospital for this issue and I was training indoors. And I remember in the middle of a race, I had to get out of the middle of the race. My lungs were on fire. I could not breathe oxygen. I was, I mean, I was inhaling, but I wasn't getting any oxygen. At least I didn't feel like I was. And what I was, was having an asthma attack for the first time in my life. It scared the hell out of me. And of course I'm in the water at the time and you, you know, I was, I was really, really scared. And I started blacking out and I, I remember running outside. It was a February championship meet and I pushed the double doors open and there's snow on the ground <laughs> and I'm soaking wet from the pool. I mean, I just got out in the middle of the race and ran out there and I just remember oh, air. I didn't care that it was 26 degrees. You know, it was, it was so refreshing <laughs> to just have oxygen and That was a big turning point for me. And we could go on and on about this, but if you have a bromine pool, a very similar chemistry is happening. You don't have chloramines, you have bromamines. The issue here is not whether whether you have chlorine or bromine or anything like that. The issue is, do you have nitrogen in your water? If you do, you're going to have byproducts. Now, a lot of this is inevitable, Joe. You can't have no nitrogen if you have bathers using the water because nitrogen comes out of our bodies through the peptides, amino acids, the sweat, the urea, the urea in the sweat. Now, most urea that gets introduced to the pool comes from urine. It's when people pee in the pool. So peeing in the pool is a really bad thing, but it's also a part of competitive swimming culture. Yeah, it's gross. Got it. But it's also the truth. So far, we've really only covered inorganic chloramines here or inorganic nitrogen, meaning pure ammonia. Well, what about everything else, Joe? I mean, I just mentioned urea. Urea falls into the second category, which is organic. And I've got my notes here. Um, Organic is nitrogen that's not just pure ammonia. It's not just NH3. It's a compound of ammonia or it's a compound of nitrogen that may contain ammonia like urea, but it comes from people, proteins, peptides, amino acids, Uh, volatile organic compounds, man-made chemicals. The biggest culprit here, Joe, is ammonia-based algicides. Huge culprit on this. And another one is deck cleaners. So if you're a commercial pool operator listening to this, by the way, thank you. Apparently, we've been hearing from a lot of people. We're getting a lot of commercial pool operators listening to this, and that's really cool. Look at every chemical in your pump room. Look at every chemical that gets introduced to the pool deck. I'm talking window cleaners, I'm talking deck cleaners, anything that you use to spray down equipment with, if it contains anything that resembles the word ammonia, get rid of it. Don't use it. You don't want it anywhere near your pool because a few spritzes of Windex will noticeably change your combined chlorine because Windex is ammonia. That's what we need to pay attention to. And I've got a good story about this that I went to a water park, we shall leave it unnamed, and it had seven bodies of water indoors. Now, three of those seven had horrible combined chlorine problems. And I mean, just off the charts, four or five parts per million kind of combined chlorine. Now, remember, we were trying to stay less than half of one part per million. And they had four or five parts per million. Just huge, astronomical. And I'm thinking, there's not enough urine in every kid in this water park to get that high. You just, you wouldn't have those kind of numbers. Something's up. Either we're getting a faulty reading, which is possible, Joe, as you know. I mean, there are false positives, but not at that level, not consistently across three. And this was a water park with state-of-the-art control systems and probes and everything. And uh, after about two hours of scratching my head, inspecting everything I could, I mean, I, I went through every pipe. I was following the pipes in the pump room and everything, looking like a total moron. Finally, it kind of dawns on me. I'm like, there's just no way you could have... Wait a second, what do you clean your pool deck with? And he's like, oh, I'll show you. And he walks me out into this chemical closet, and there's a 55-gallon drum, and I wrote down the product. I'm not going to say the brand, but it's a floor disinfection cleaner, and I'm going to read the top four active ingredients. You ready for this? Ready. Now, I'm not a chemist, so if I mispronounce these... (laughs) um, Good luck. It's it's kind of like if you can't if you can't read the ingredients on your food, you probably shouldn't consume it. You know, like that little thing. Hey, if you if you can't pronounce everything on here, you shouldn't be eating this. Um, 
which would rule out most candy, but let's let's move on. Okay, here we are. <laughs> Octal decal dimethyl ammonium chloride. Ooh. That's the first one. Didiesel dimethyl ammonium chloride. That's the second one. Doctyl dimethyl ammonium chloride. I think there's a trend here. And then alkyl dimethyl benzyl ammonium chloride. And then the rest of it's inert ingredients. Now, we've got four different types of ammonium chloride in this deck cleaner. And I told him, there's your problem. And so we go inside. And remember, it's only three of the, of the seven bodies of water that have this issue. And lo and behold, they use a Zamboni cleaner, which is a cool cleaning device that you've probably seen it. Think of a Zamboni on an ice rink, but it cleans your pool deck. And it uses this cleaning agent. And of those four pools that had no issues, they all had rope fences around them. So the Zamboni couldn't get next to the pool. But the three bodies of water who were off the charts, the Zamboni could drive right over the gutter. And so it was putting ammonia directly into circulation. And suddenly it all made sense. And I felt like Bill Nye. I mean, it was such an epiphany that we had just, or actually Bill Nye is not a good example. Dr. House. I was like, oh yes, this is what did it. I said, hey, you call that company, get it replaced, no more ammonia. And I got a call from him like two weeks later. He said, dude, our combined chlorine is gone. He had UV on every system anyway. He said that you solved our problem. And I want to get this out of here that there is no chemical way to get rid of ammonia or any nitrogen compound without chlorine combining to it. Um, there's no chemical way. Now there is a secondary way, which we'll discuss in the next episode, but you have to go through this combined chlorine process. There isn't an enzyme. Oh God, I wish there were though. There isn't an enzyme that can break down nitrogen. There's only bacteria that can break down nitrogen. And of course, chlorine kills bacteria. So you can't really do that. So if you have it in your pool, you have to go through this combined chlorine process. And it consumes a lot of your chlorine to do this. Remember, we talked about a 5 to 1 molar ratio just to get through purified ammonia. Just NH3. Forget urea and complex you know, chloroorganic compounds. That's a lot more. But just to get to trichloramine... You're looking at a 15 to 1 ratio of free chlorine or hypochlorous acid to ammonia. 15 to 1 to get rid of that. And that's the easy stuff. So you're going to have a huge chlorine demand if you have a lot of nitrogen constantly being introduced. So all that is to say, if you have combined chlorine, find the nitrogen source and eliminate it. Address it immediately at its source. Get as little nitrogen in your pool as, pro as possible. Now, that's the preventative way, but Joe, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so, you know, it's one of the reasons also why people who let their animals swim in the pool have so much more demand for chlorine because every time an animal comes in the pool, your dogs, they pee. That's what they do. And that's yep. more ammonia. And they're putting more of that in there than, you know, throwing however many toddlers in the swimming pool. So, mm -hmm. Just know that when you do that, you're also increasing that consumption of chlorine because it's going through that process that Eric just described. Right, right. And I've, I've got this book here. By the way, if you want a really, really good textbook on chemistry, I'm referring, and I've got a lot of sources here, but the one that is the most cogent that I've read is by Robert Lowry, and it's called The Intermediate Training Manual. And we actually link to it on our, on our website. Got to give credit where it's due. This is an awesome, awesome textbook that just breaks this down. And uh, I claim no knowledge of this because I'm just reading straight from the book, but you should get that book and uh, it'll explain if you're interested in this. But to get down to ammonia out of urea, I'm just going to give an example here, okay? If we know that it's a 15 to 1 molar ratio to get rid of already purified ammonia, how many reactions, Joe, just take a guess, just pick a number, how many reactions do you think it takes to get urea converted to ammonia to then start the uh, combined chlorine process to get rid of ammonia? How many Ooh, reactions a, to convert a, it to ammonia? That's a fun trivia question, Eric. Fun trivia question. Let's yep. say seven. Lucky number seven. Okay. There's two ways you can look at this. I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. There's nine on this page. But there's a couple ways to look at this. You could accelerate this if you have a secondary disinfection oxidation system. Okay, so that you got to keep that in mind. But once you get down to pure urea, because urea is not always pure. I mean, if you if you 
if you're peeing in the pool, it's there's not just urea in there. Urea is contained in your urine, but there's other stuff too. There's peptides, amino acids, etc. So once you get there, there's three equations that convert down. And these are on our website. If you want to nerd out, have at it. Um, it's a lot of subscript and superscript and valences and, oh boy. I mean, I don't really... I don't really want to talk about it. So it just, it's, it's available on there. It's in this, it's in this textbook as well. It's online. Uh, just trust us on this. You don't want it in your pool. Joe, can we agree on that? You don't want urea in your pool? We can totally agree on that. Okay, cool. Because if there were an enzyme that could get rid of urea, oh, wow. We would be really, really popular, especially in commercial <laughs> pools. But, but there isn't, unfortunately, not yet. Um, but, you know. Put that challenge out there. Any chemists listening to this, you think you can get rid of, a, in a safe way, in a chlorinated environment, break down urea so chlorine doesn't have to? Call us. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> we'll listen to you. But, uh, you know, it's got to be NSF certified because that's what we do at Arenda. So anyway, that is what combined chlorine is. So, Joe, if you don't mind, let's just recap this. And then in the next episode, we're going to actually talk about what we can do about it. Absolutely. Let's wrap it up. You want to you want to take a stab at it? Or you want me to? Oh, go ahead. By all means, talk through all that chemistry. You kind of made me tired. Yeah, no. Well, it is <laughs> early in the morning. I mean, it's I'm tired too, and you're drinking coffee. And by coffee, he means Pappy Van Winkle on ice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just saw that that show, The Heist, on Netflix about the Pappy Van Winkle getting stolen, and I know Joe's a an aficionado, and he knew exactly what I was talking about. So. Not that you actually have Pappy in your mug, but I bet you wish you did. <laughs> I, I would love that, yes. Yeah, yeah. It goes great with coffee, I hear. Okay, anyway, um, if you have combined chlorine, all it means is you have ammonia or nitrogen compounds in your water, or you had them. And chlorine is in the process of combining with those nitrogen compounds to oxidize them down into their lowest form. Now, for pure ammonia... It gets oxidized down to trichloramine, which goes into the air, and it actually leaves your pool. Okay, and then it becomes an air issue. Totally different episode just on air and chloramines in the air. But for everything else, these chloroorganic compounds, the, the more complex stuff, the ureas and everything else, um, usually when you oxidize those down, the lowest form, I guess we didn't actually mention this, the lowest form of nitrogen that you can have, meaning it cannot be oxidized any further, is going to be a nitrate. You're going to oxidize this stuff down. Eventually, you're going to get nitrates. Now, nitrates are pretty inert, but there's only one way to get rid of them. Drain and dilute. Kind of like sulfates. There's only one way to get them out. Drain and dilute. Unless you reverse osmosis, in which case that'll take it out too, but that's kind of cost prohibitive in most places. Uh, that being said, you have to physically remove it. There's nothing else you can do chemically to get rid of this stuff. So if you get nitrogen in there, you can bet that your chlorine is going to be tied up trying to get rid of that stuff. And that is not good. We do not want that. So I appreciate you listening to this episode as, you know, this is our first time doing it in the, in the early morning. So I'm, I feel a little bit slow, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm awake now. So thank you for listening to the Rule Your Pool podcast. It really means a lot. And, and I just want to say, um, having been on the hotline at Arenda for the last week, the amount of people that are calling us because of this podcast is heartwarming to me. It's just amazing that that we actually have an audience. We were joking about it last week that we didn't even think we had an audience. Um, that's only a joke. We actually have an enormous audience that's growing every day and that it's organically growing because people are telling their friends, thank you for that. We can see a lot of people sharing this. If you know somebody that has a pool and you think that this would be valuable for them or their pool operator or interested in pool operation or whatever else, Please share it with them. We do this for free because, well, we really like doing it, honestly. Podcasts are easy. Uh, well, compared to like scripting a whole video, you know, Joe, like when we get in the studio, <laughs> that's a lot of work. This clearly is not scripted. <laughs> and we can wing it quite a bit. So we, we do with yeah. the best of them. Yeah, th this is a lot This is a lot easier to do. It's basically a Zoom call. But we do appreciate you listening. And uh, you can reach out to us if you have questions. You can reach out to us on our Facebook, which is just Arenda Technologies or go through the app and contact us there. Uh, we're, we're not hard to find. We're really easy to get to. So thank you so much for listening. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about what we can actually do about this stuff and how to get it out of your water. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to Rule Your Pool, a podcast by Arenda Technologies. 
For more information on what we discussed in this week's episode, check the links in the description or visit www.horrendatech.com. I hope you find this show valuable enough that you tap that subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can also like us on Facebook and social media. And with our help, you'll be able to rule your pool without over-treating it with chemicals and wasting money. I'll see you next episode. 